Robert Heinlein is considered one of the most influential science fiction authors of the 20th century. However, few people realize that when Robert was a budding juvenile author, he and his wife Virginia, Ginny, spent over a decade living in a... Strange land! The king and queen of science fiction in Colorado Springs. Destination, Colorado. In 1950, shortly after being wed, Robert and Ginny bought property on Mesa Avenue. The Heinlands were able to choose any house number they wanted between 17 and 1800. Both being American patriots and military veterans, they fittingly settled on 1776. Building their own house was an exciting, if daunting, process. That was a dream of his for a long time before we actually did it. Before we did anything, he insisted that I read Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House. We both did read it, in fact, and when it came to building, we did not make those mistakes, but we made others that that author had not thought of. The Highlands ran into the issue of rising lumber and materials costs. Colorado Springs was growing, and increasing construction on military installations such as Ent Air Force Base was crunching the market. The guest house where they stayed on Cheyenne Boulevard had a mice infestation, and Ginny decided they needed a cat to put their unwanted roommates in check. They moved into their house in August, and days later she brought home a marmalade kitten named Pixie, which prompted the installation of a cateteria, a built-in pet feeding system. Pixie's feeder would be one of the many features the Heinlands put into their future-focused house. They hired a local science fiction author and scientist, Harry Stein, to help with the installation of a full house audio system, complete with control room. Sliding doors in the walls allowed the dining table to be moved easily between the kitchen and dining room. There were specially sized shelving units and storage spaces throughout the house depending on the requirements of a given room. The house is completely sealed. There is a 20% fresh air replacement on each cycle, water vapor, and ethylene glycol added, dust removed, and the air heated. The Heinlands settled into their brick block house with aluminum trim and began their life in Colorado Springs. Springs Cadet. The Heinlands quickly integrated into the social scene of the city. Robert's fame was growing due to the upcoming adaptation of his novel Rocket Ship Galileo into the film Destination Moon. In May 1949, Heinlein was the guest speaker for the Quill Club, a local writing club hosted at the city auditorium. Nuts to the talk about plot structure. You are a creative artist. Nobody should tell you what to put into a story. 1952 turned into a busy social year. Ginny, who was an ice dancer, got the couple involved in the National Figure Skating Championship. The couple often enjoyed skating recreationally, particularly at the Broadmoor Ice Palace. In June, the Highlands welcomed fellow science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke. Robert and Arthur had been corresponding for some time, and the Highlands gave Clarke a truly local experience, taking him up Pikes Peak and into a mine shaft. They also hosted a dinner with Clarke and local author Amanda Ellis. Heinlein was everything, like Walt Whitman. There were aspects of things I didn't like, but I never argued with him seriously. In 1958, Ginny began taking an extension course in Russian. Her and Robert had wanted to visit Russia for some time, but it was dangerous behind the Iron Curtain. Finally, in 1960, they made the trip. When they returned, they wanted to inform people about what they had experienced. Robert was invited to speak at the Cadet Forum at the Air Force Academy. Ginny gave a series of lectures to the local church guilds, being hosted at such places as Chapel of Our Savior in the Broadmoor. She also gave a lecture, illustrated with photographs she had taken, to the Fine Arts Center's members' dinner. Have liberty, will nuke! On October 4th, 1957, the USSR launched Sputnik 1, the first Earth-orbiting satellite. 
The Heinleins were terrified of the implications that this had upon America's vulnerability in the Cold War. If the Russians could put that payload in that orbit, then it seemed extremely likely that they could hit us anywhere they wanted to with warheads. In April of 1958, the Heinleins were shocked to see an ad in the Colorado Springs Gazette Telegraph funded by a Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy, who advocated for the discontinuation of hydrogen bomb testing. The Heinleins were incensed, and the following week self-funded their own rebuttal asking, who are the heirs of Patrick Henry? You do realize, if we run this ad, we're going to lose half our friends in town? The full-page ad was a literal call to arms, explaining point by point why the same committee's position would amount to nothing more than capitulation to the Soviets. We want America made supremely strong and we are resolved to accept all burdens necessary to that end. We ask for total effort, nuclear testing, research and development, highest priorities for rocketry, sterner education, anything that is needed. We are ready to pay higher taxes, forgo luxuries, work harder. To this we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Robert put his writing on hold, and he and Ginny invested all of their time and money into the Patrick Henry League, a pro-nuclear grassroots organization, and encouraged others to set up their own chapters around the country. Despite months of hard work, the Patrick Henry League failed to build a strong support, and ultimately, after six weeks, only 500 signatures had found their way to President Eisenhower. I can see the bleak fact that my methods did not work, especially as the movement did not effectively take root elsewhere. Double story! Wanting to transition out of juvenile fiction, Robert had spent most of the decade plotting his manuscript for a work called The Heretic, a science fiction retelling of The Jungle Book about a boy raised by Martians. However, he put this aside and wrote a book that would seem to reflect his views of the experience he had had with the Patrick Henry League. In 1959, Robert would release Starship Troopers, the novel follows Juan Johnny Rico, a member of the mobile infantry in a futuristic space war between mankind and an alien race of insect-like creatures. Starship Troopers would win the prestigious science fiction Hugo Award in 1960 and became a monument of the genre for the era. The dehumanization of the enemy, who are derogatorily referred to as bugs, has led many critics to consider the book an example of Cold War era fascist propaganda a view lampooned in the 1997 film adaptation directed by Paul Verhoeven. In 1961, Robert finally released his decade-long labor of love, The Heretic, under the new title, Stranger in a Strange Land. That story could not be published commercially until the public mores changed. I could see them changing, and it turned out I had timed it right. It was the story of Valentine Michael Smith, a man raised in Martian culture who had no knowledge of humanity. Throughout the novel, he goes from gradually learning about Earth and its customs to teaching his Martian knowledge and actively challenging the norms of human society by starting his own commune and church. Stranger in a Strange Land would win the Hugo Award in 1962 and would become the first science fiction book to become a New York Times bestseller. As fellow science fiction novelist Kurt Vonnegut would later say, No stranger to controversy, Heinlein saw the novel as an opportunity to launch frontal assaults on the two biggest, fattest, sacred cows of Western society, monotheism and monogamy. Stranger in a Strange Land was revered by and associated with the counterculture of the times, who connected with the free love communal utopian society presented in the book. This resulted in the book being removed from many school reading lists and libraries by conservative educators. Heinlein's Freehold
As the global threat of nuclear war grew, the military presence in Colorado Springs made it a strategically valuable target, a status cemented with the construction of the Cheyenne Mountain Complex, which housed the North American Aerospace Defense Command. Suddenly, the Highlands found themselves at the doorstep of the Nuclear Control Center of the United States. In October of 1961, the Highlands began construction on a blast shelter capable of withstanding every threat except for a direct hit. Each shelter built reduces our vulnerability to blackmail, increases our national chances if it comes to the worst. Neither you, nor I, nor any other individual can build a shelter that will take anything. But we most certainly can vastly improve our chances, and with that, our country's chances. In 1963, Robert wrote a book in under a month inspired by their bomb shelter experience called Farnham's Freehold. In early 1962, Robert and Ginny both experienced health problems. Robert was found to have amoebic dysentery, a lack of organisms in his stool. In other words, I produce pure crap. This will come as no surprise to many literary critics. In October of 1965, Ginny, whose health issues were continuing to elude medical explanations, diagnosed herself with anoxia, or mountain sickness. She reflected on how much better she felt when they traveled, particularly at lower altitudes, and how her condition would slowly deteriorate after returning home. The decision was made to leave. The Highlands immediately began packing and searching for where to go next. Robert Heinlein is now considered one of the grand masters of the golden era of science fiction, one of the big three along with Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. Ginny played a critical role in editing his works and assisting him both creatively and scientifically throughout the remainder of their lives. On their 17th wedding anniversary, the Heinleins left Colorado Springs, no longer strangers to this strange land.